Hi, fashion dolls. It is simply Saturday, February 19th. Welcome to an all-new episode of Style by Stevie Daytime. Our very special guest today is a singer and actor, and you might have seen him in a few Tyler Perry hit shows. Joining me today, ladies and gentlemen, we have Maurice Lochner, and I'm super honored and excited to be doing this interview with him. Let's get started, ladies and gentlemen. All right, let me share this live and let everyone know that I am going to be doing this platform today. I'm super excited, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you guys are all doing wonderful. Let's get started. Hi, Stephen. Make sure you guys please go and follow the incomparable Stephen Sticks Perry. Ladies and gentlemen, joining me today, we have an acting vet, Maurice Lochner. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome him. Yo. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to the dollhouse. Right. Happy Saturday. Thank you. I'm doing good. How are you? I'm doing excellent. It's such an honor to meet you. Likewise, likewise, likewise. I hope you're having a great day. I am. I'm doing wonderful, blessed, and highly favored. So before we get into this interview, how has 2022 been for you thus far this year? Because I know it's been from 2020 to 2021, it's been a hectic year so how's this year been for you thus far um this year's been good i mean i'm blessed i can't complain um i mean i'm, I'm alive I'm, I'm well um i don't have covid i had it last year i think was it last year yeah i had oh, it last no. year um and I'm, I'm doing well you know what i'm saying i can't complain about anything man my family's well everybody's um doing good my kids are well my grandchild is well so you know i I can't complain about anything, man. I'm just glad to be alive and, and uh, impacting uh, people around me. You know what I mean? Absolutely, 100%. And I said the same thing, that I'm still here. You know, no COVID or anything. I haven't caught it. And I've been staying safe and just, you know, just thankful to be alive, you know, each and every day for me because I get up and I do my morning devotion. And we'll be talking about your free ministries, what you do here on Instagram yeah. with your partner as well, too. So I'm super excited about that. Yeah. All right, Fashion Dolls. But before we can get to the free ministries, tell us a little bit about Maurice, how the journey began, because we seen you and we, the world got to know you alongside the incomparable Tyler Perry. So... We'll get to that fast forward, but the journey. How did the journey for Maurice begin? Um, well, I got into the business with one of, one of my uh, close friends and uh, kind of introduced me into the business. Um, you guys know her as Pam on Martin, Tashina Arnold. And um, yes. so she kind of introduced me to the business. We all went to high school together. I mean, we went to the high school of music and the performing arts, uh, which is known as the fame school. Um, in uh, New York City, um, which let me see, it was it was up in Harlem first, as it was Music and Art High School, and then we combined with Performing Arts, and then they named it Fiorella LaGuardia School of the P Music and the Performing Arts. So we had, um, let me see, a drama department, a musical instrument department, art department, dance department, um, vocal <laughs> department, and what else? Did I cover everything? Yeah, I think I covered everything. So when we combined, we they built a brand new school down in Lincoln Center. And that the school was purposely for the, you know, kids like myself who aspired to go into um, the performing arts or being artists. Um, and um, so there were a lot of a lot of famous people um, actually went to that school. Um, Jennifer Anderson with, um, graduated from from uh, LaGuardia School of the Arts, um, Carl Payne, um, Seth Gilliam, uh, it's so many. I mean, I, I don't even wanna, I can't, I don't wanna get into all of the people who went there. I mean, there were so many people, Tashina Arnold, Victor Cook, a lot of Broadway artists. And um, so I started after that, you know, Tashina um, SAG had a, write, had a writer's strike and they gave the artists um, liberty to kind of create their their roles by writing different stories. And so within that, Tashina invited myself, along with three other friends of ours, to uh, be 
a glee club on one of the hottest um, soap operas there was at that point. Outside of um, All My Children, it was Ryan's Hope. And so um, she called me and a couple of my friends, and we were the glee club on that show. And they actually hired me to be her, to, they casted me as her best friend. So I got additional shows. And um, so I ended up doing, in that writer strike, I ended up doing, having a reoccurring role on Ryan's Hope. And I did like, uh, I want to say 13 shows. So that was cool. Okay. So that's where I got my start. Uh, yeah. Okay. And fast forward, after Ryan's Hope, we also seen you on the Cosby Show as Herman. Yeah. Um, I had um, Jeffrey on the show, Jeffrey Owens on the show, and he was talking about Felicia Rashad and some advice that she gave him. Mm -hmm. What was some of the advice that you received from Miss Miss Felicia if she gave you any, or Malcolm Jamal Warner? Um, the, I don't. I, I was a little. I was a little bit older than Malcolm. Um, most of my camaraderie was with um, the new actors that came on, like Karen, Karen White, Karen Melina White, um, Erica Alexander. Yes. Alan Payne, Mushan Lee. So that's who I kind of stuck around most of the time. But it was it was an, a, a great, great experience. You know, when I read for them, oh, actually, when I got the job, it was all God that 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 provided me these opportunities. And um, I was just, you know, I was just praying. I was I asked my manager, who also managed Tashina Arnold at that time. Um, I was like, you know, how come I've never gotten an audition for Cosby Show? And she was like, Maurice, well, you know, there's some things that just didn't come up, you know. So I would always look and see who was casting. And so lo and behold, one day I was out. I was on an audition. I was auditioning for um, Black Nativity, and um, who was produced by um, uh, like Hattie Winston. Hattie Winston was the lady who was on Sesame Street um, years yes. ago. So I'm telling my age now, <laughs> but years ago. And um, so I went and auditioned and I, I, I booked the Black Nativity and also got a call on my way home. And my manager was like, Maurice, guess what? I got an audition for you at the Cosby show, for the Cosby show. I was like, word, I was excited. You know, I'm on the train. I couldn't couldn't think of nothing else. But, you know, this was being an uh, answered prayer. And um, I got home, you know, um, got ready for the next day. I went in the door. As soon as I walked in the door, which is, this is so crazy. The um, Barry Moss, who was the um, the casting director for years for the Cosby show, as soon as I walked in the door, he was like, you're the type we're looking for. We're going to work with you. And so it's like it, it was sealed as soon as I walked in the door. And um, I booked it. And the, the one of the most impactful things that happened was that when I went to the callback and then they booked, they, they, they hired me, I went to the reading the first day. Um, the, the writers had written, you know, a line in there that, you know, I was like, you know, sometimes you read the line, you don't know how you're going to read it, you don't know what you're going to say, how you're going to deliver the line. But um, when I delivered the line, everybody in the room started laughing, including Bill Cosby. And so mm. afterwards, they were like, hey, if you keep delivering like that, they're going to keep calling you, they're going to keep writing you in, they're going to keep writing you. So I ended up doing having a reoccurring role on the Cosby show. I, I, I filmed five times. And um, so that was like amazing. But the big thing was, is that um, doing Black Nativity, we opened up the show and Felicia Rashad shows up. <laughs> she's in the audience. And she's sitting there flabbergasted because she was like, wait a minute, that's, that's Maurice, that's the big fella. He can say, mm -hmm. <laughs> not knowing, not knowing that she was on the board of directors for that show. And so, um, you know, she goes back and she tell, tells Mr. Cosby um, that I could sing. And uh, the world knows this. A lot of you all know this who uh, are on that um, we would we were filming. And this was my last, this was my last show actually. And we were filming and um, 
Bill Cosby pulled me to the side and he was like, hey, Maurice, you know, I want you to sing on the show today. He says, I think the message that we're trying to give to young men, um, this would would really seal it for the message that we're going to do. I want you to sing on the show. So it wasn't scripted. It wasn't in the script. He just randomly pulled me to the side. He was like, I want you to sing on the show. And so I thought that this was like afterwards was one of the biggest opportunities in my career to be exposed to the world on the hottest black television show that has ever been produced. And here I am, you know, singing on the show in front of the world. And, um, you know, I often think of, you know, when we celebrate Black History Month, I think of Bill Cosby because, and I think of Felicia mm -hmm. Rashad because though, you know, people, allegations and all different types of things that, you know, we, we've heard, the world have heard um, things that, you know, we've, he's been judged and everything. You know, I often think of, you know, we are human beings mm -hmm. who make mistakes all the time, every day, pretty much. But one thing that I can always accredit to him is that, for me, I became a legend unbeknown to myself. Someone had to tell me this. I became a legend that day when he asked me to sing because I found out that I was the first person to ever sing Christian gospel on the show. And um, and then I thought, you know, like such an amazing man, you know, who would give me this opportunity to sing on the, sh on the show, which wasn't even in the script. So it was all God that just gave me that opportunity. And I, I want to say it was, I want to say that it was one of the biggest, if not the biggest opportunity that I've had because people still remember me to this day. And that happened in 1990 something, you know. So, um, you know, Bill Cosby is, is amazing. Uh, Felicia Rashad, the whole cast, pretty much everybody, it was like what you saw on television. It was a family, you know what I mean? And, um, and I had become a part of that family you know, um, those five episodes that I filmed. And um, it, it, it was great. You know, um, Malcolm Jamal, I, my family would do concerts, Malcolm Jamal and, and um, his girlfriend who passed away, um, they would come to my shows. I had house parties where Karen and Alan Payne would come to my house and be in my basement. <laughs> and, you know, it was like the real house party. And they're at my house. And, you know, celebrating my birthday with me. And so it was like, it was really, really a cool, cool experience. And then what really blew me away was when Felicia Shaw put me to the side. And she was like, I'm having Christmas dinner at my house. I would love for you to come. I'm like, what? <laughs> like, to your house? Leotine Price was there. Brian Gumbo was there. I'm sitting there like, oh, man. You know, so these, the love that they show is like, I, I want to say I haven't gotten that love with anybody else that I worked with like that to be like personal you know what I mean they they come they invite you into their space you know so I mean it was it was really really a blessing man so that it started with Tashina opening introducing me to it and then me auditioning and doing America's Most Wanted or doing um, you know uh, Black Nativity with Hattie Winston Hattie Winston was, is a legend her husband um, Harold Wheeler um, is was the musical director for Dancing with the Stars. So I met all of these people in that time, you know. So it's been a great, great experience. And and, and I'll, we'll talk more about the ups and downs and all that kind of stuff, too. Thank you all. Thank you all. Everyone is saying blessings. Wow. The, the untold story. I never knew you auditioned for America's Most Wanted. Oh, I was on so, it. I was on it. Oh. I was on America. <laughs> that was the first time I shot a real big gun. <laughs> yeah. The orchestra director, he is a legend. Yes, yeah. Maurice is a legend. He's all right. He just said that, and I was going to say it as well, too. You are, definitely. So we've been past this, the Cosby Show. Now fast forward to working alongside the incomparable Tyler Perry. What was it like getting that call? that he wanted you to start in some of his features because you've been in quite a few of them. Let's go down the list here. Um, Medea on the run. You did uh, the haves and have nots. Medea gets a job. 
which one is one of my favorites um, <laughs> with Patrice Lovely. Shout outs to her. Yeah. Um, Op Band's Place. You did a Medea's Christmas. Yeah. Oh, the husband was scandalous in that one, y'all. So, <laughs> yeah. But that one, the haves and the have nots. And Medea's, Medea gets a job. Medea gets a job. You and I think it was Chandra Corelli did a song. Yeah. That's called. They left me. They just yeah, left. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was a beautiful, outstanding duet. So before we get to that song and, you know, the collaboration and everything, tell us what was it like getting a call from Mr. Perry? What was running through your mind? Um, let me see. Um, well, what happened, the, the, the whole thing with it, I mean, that was just like a crazy, crazy time. Um, we, my wife and I, we transitioned to North Carolina from Brooklyn. Um, and uh, at that point, I was singing with um, corporate bands, you know, doing weddings and all, all of those different things. And um, it was near the end of the year and things just uh, slowing up. And um, we, um, we moved. I was traveling back and forth traveling back and forth from, from, from North Carolina to, to Brooklyn or to Manhattan, wherever where the gig was. And, you know, I told the companies that I worked with, I said, listen, if you don't have more than two gigs for me, it doesn't really make sense for me to try to come up there. And um, I was on the bus, taking a Chinese bus. I was taking the plane. Uh, all, I was doing everything, you know, to go back and make $1,500 or whatever it was for the weekend. And so everything started slowing up at that point. And then um, I started, you know, hitting some hard times. You know, my, you know, the gigs started, they slowed up a whole lot. And um, I remember the car that we drove down to, uh, to North Carolina was, was repossessed. And so I, I was, you know, paying my, we were renting a house. We were paying the rent pretty much at the end of the month, not at the beginning of the month when it was due. <laughs> we were paying at the end of the month most of the time. And I was like, thank God we know the person who knows the person who owns this house, you know, because she they probably would have kicked us out. But um, it was just one day I was just like, you know, I was down. You know, I was like, you know, took my car. There was a guy down the street who had a, a, a Toyota Celica, like a 1992 for $600. And I was like, well, I'm gonna buy this car because we can't be without a car. And so um, I was in my garage because I'm a self-taught barber. And I had my, my, my brother was there, Swayze, and I was cutting his hair and my phone rings. And it was Tony Grant. Now, Tony Grant and I, we did shows together um, we did um, the story about Dorothy Height, who was an activist who marched with Martin Luther King. And so we did that with, with the infamous George Faison. Um, and if you guys don't know who George Faison, George Faison was, uh, is, a, is a legend. Look him up, George Faison. He was in the original Wiz. Um, he choreographed um, Ain't Miss um, of Sophisticated Ladies. Great, great chore choreographer, director. Anyhow, um, I called him up. He calls me. He was like, yo, Maurice. He's like, what's going on? What you doing? I said, man, I need about $5,000. You know, because I'm thinking my car just got repossessed. So I, he was like, man, I ain't giving you no $5,000. So we started laughing. He says, but I'm calling you in an opportunity. And the words that I prayed at least two or three weeks prior, I said, God, I have this gift. I said, I need an opportunity to use it. And I said, God, I, with this next job, I said, I'd like to work with this person five years or more. And here he, here he comes. He calls me and he's like, yo, I just told Tyler's people about you. They were looking for somebody to play the role of the father in the Christmas play. And I was like, what? He's like, yeah, man. He says, but this is what I told him, Maurice. He said, yo, you guys need to, you guys need to hear this guy. And he was like, not only can he sing, he was like, but he's a good dude. Y'all need y'all need to have him in your around in your camp. And I was like, Dad, you know, so and that's where I think the other day I had um posted about influence, you know, how it's very powerful. And for him to say that about me, that it had to be something about my character 
to where I would influence him in a way to where he would rep, uh, present me to that camp with those words. And so five minutes later, Tyler Perry Studios, I see it on my call ID. They called me. And he was like, hey, Maurice, you know, um, we, we looked you up. Um, Tony, Tony Grant told us about you. Um, are you available to fly into Atlanta tomorrow to audition? And I was like, um, yeah, they were like, well, we're going to call you with your itinerary um, and we're looking forward to meeting you tomorrow. I said, all right, cool. So got on the plane. I went down and the, the whole time I'm like, yo, I said, I know that this is God. I met Tyler Perry the year before that at Maya Angelou's 80th birthday party. And he was moving, you know, kind of brushed me off. He, I was like, man, I've been trying to meet you. And he was like, yeah, 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 yeah. And he takes, he said, come on, let's take the picture. And he, you know, he was out of there. So I was like, I'm gonna meet him. I had no, I had no doubt. I said, time to come around, boom. And it came around a year later. And so I go and uh, I go flying that morning. They pick me up from the airport and um, I sit there and there were a bunch of people there auditioning. I saw Alexis Jones there, um, a couple of the singers and whatnot. And so the guy, there's one guy that came and sat next to me and he said, he said, um, he said, man, you look like you can sing. And so me being the joker that I am, I was like, oh, you think all big people can sing? And then he was like, I said, no, nah, I'm just joking, man. <laughs> it's like, you know, because everybody think big people can sing. Everybody's like, oh, you heavy, you, you can sing. That's not true. But anyway, so he, he went in audition. I said, you better go in there and do what you got to do. I said, because I know what I came to do. And I said it just like that. So you've been going there. I said, we both here trying to get a gig. And um, so he went in. Tyler Perry came down. He was a great actor, but his singing was so-so. Tyler Perry came down. He was like, y'all call me back when y'all find somebody that can sing. And so I just sat there patiently waiting, had my base, my Yankee baseball cap turned backwards, had my little knapsack on, and I'm walking around. And so they were like, okay, Maurice, come on in. I went in, I sang, and um, Mark Swinton, I'll never forget it. He sat there and he just looked at me for like 20 seconds. And that's a long time to be looking at somebody. <laughs> it's like, I'm like, a little uncomfortable. But, you know. He was like, I said, what, man? What's, what's, what's the matter? He's like, I wasn't expecting that from you, for real. He says, honestly, I really wasn't expecting that from you. And so I was like, you know, well, thank you. And so I read the script. And then, and so, you know, the language when you go to auditions, they're like, well, do you have time to hang around? You know, um, I was like, I can't go anywhere until y'all take me back to the airport. So, yeah, I got time. And so um, I, I, um, I go back and sit down. And they was like, well, can you come upstairs with us? So I was like, cool. Go upstairs. We go walk into uh, uh, Tyler Perry's office carpet so thick your footprint is down in the car it's like, and you can smell the leather off of the furniture man and so he's sitting behind his desk and we walk in Alexis Jones another young lady whose name I can't remember and myself the young lady sang Alexis sang and then I sang and he was like okay okay I heard you know I mean, it's, it's good and so then we all leave so the first person I called was my grandfather. He was like one of my biggest fans at this point. I mean, he was like my, my biggest fan, period. Um, alongside some of my, my wife and my family, you know. But my grandfather, he was, that was my man. And so I said, Dad, he said, how'd the audition go? I said, it went great, man. And then he, yeah, I said, listen, I said, if he doesn't hire me, he's never going to forget me. I said, my voice is still singing in the room. And so he started laughing. And um, so I went downstairs and sat down. Went downstairs and sat down. And um, a good friend of mine now, Erwin, um, he comes downstairs and he says, hey, you know, they want to hire you to be the father. And I was like, word. And he was like, that's all you got to say is word. I was like, that's all I got to say. Because I felt, I in my heart, I knew that all of this was strategically planned by God. You know, so I wasn't surprised. I was happy. You know, of course, and then I called my wife and I was like, I got it. And she was like, what? You know, so we were excited, you know, because here's something that we prayed about. And um, here we are. So I go home, 
A week later, pack my clothes and then head back and start rehearsals. And so that was the beginning. So if you got another question, I'll I'll go to part two after that. <laughs> All right. Yeah. And then fast forward, all the other plays came along. Yeah. But the one that stood out to me the most was the duet that you did with Chandra Corelli. Like that song really brought me to tears wow. watching it throughout the stage play. It was so beautiful. Yeah. Um, how did the, how did it, how did this song, They Left Me, come to be on this particular project, Medea Gets a Job? Because it was so beautiful. Yeah. So what happens with the, the, the songs, like, um, Tyler Perry pretty much writes the songs and we kind of come in and we'll put out our input in it and we'll we'll pretty much create the movement of it, if you would. You know, um, and so when he paired me with Chandra, I was like, <laughs> I said, this is going to be really, really dope. <laughs> I was like, I was like, this is going to be dope. This is going to be amazing because our voices are some, somewhat similar in tone um, because I know I was classically trained and I'm sure that she has some classical training behind her. If you hear the timbre in her voice and then everyone asks me, have you been classically trained? And, and yeah, I, I have um, because of our approach is just a slightly different. And even though she has that style, you know, um, yes. the discipline and just what we what we present and how we present, you know, our songs and the character in, in, in which we play, you know, we went into rehearsal, he gave us the words and we kind of just put everything together as far as how we're going to move and the harmonies and things like that. So um, it was dope. It was really, really dope. Um, but my favorite, along with that one, is Mary Did You Know with Alexis. Um, it's like, I, I love that song, period. So when he asked, he was kind of, we were at the end of the sh of rehearsals, and we were like, yeah, we want to close it out with some Christmas songs. And um, <laughs> and so he was like, who knows Mary Did You Know? And I was like, I do. And then being that Alexis and I was supposed to be um, having a relationship in the play, you know, he Mm -hmm. He put us together. <laughs> <laughs> he put us together, and um, you know we worked it out. And I and to this day, I think he posted it. He posted it. Uh, I want to say maybe the year after it went viral three times. He ain't give us a I dime. <laughs> So I know somebody got paid. <laughs> it, was like, it wasn't me, <laughs> but but no, I'm joking. <laughs> no, it wasn't me. It really, no. No, I really, I really, it really wasn't me. It, it was me singing, but whoever got paid for it going viral, I didn't get a check. I wish I did. I, I'm sure it was nice, but anyway, Alexis and I, we had so much fun doing that song. And then if you watch the video. If any of y'all that's on here that watched the video, watch the expression of with everybody around. And that, you know, I watched the video and I'm like, wow, they're just like looking at us, you know, because it was it was tough. Um it was tough because we were rehearsing every day, seven, eight hours a day. Um, you know, you really have to have um a lot of stamina as far as a singer, a performer. Um, you both should have gotten paid. You, 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 um, pray for us. <laughs> um, to, to be able to be at 110% every night or every, every day in rehearsal. And I hadn't sang a long time like that every day. So my voice took a little bit, you know, it had to kind of be um, strengthened back to health, you know, because the, the song that I did, um, the first song, Jack and Jill went up the hill to that song. I kind of 
I kind of struggled near the end of it because the, the vo- my vocal cords were very tired from rehearsing, rehearse, 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 rehearse. And learn, 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 dialogue, dialogue, dialogue. And then you have a recording. You have a taping. And so the good thing is, is that we had two shots, you know, to get the best take. So, but it was, it, it, it's, it can become very tough um, because of all of the work that we do, you know, um, to prepare for the recordings, the, the DVD recordings. And, but those are my two favorites. That song... Um, the song with Chandra Corelli was really, really a, a, a dope song. I mean, just to be put together with those two amazing artists was just great. I had a lot of fun. I had a lot of fun working with all of uh, Aunt Bam, um, all of the um, other, other, Tony, of course. Tony and I, we had history. We we worked together before. We toured together. Um, um, who else? I just met Hattie, which Patrice Lovely. We did that was our first show together, um, the Medea's Christmas, and then um, of course, um, what was the next one that we did? Oh, the Having the Have Nots, you know, and Medea yes. gets a job, you know. So all of those, we were just kind of going back to back to back. But one of the funny things <laughs> that um, when I got at the end of Medea's Christmas. I was, I told Tyler Perry had invited the cast over to his house and we, you know, just kind of had dinner and everything and celebrated the, uh, the uh, recording. And I told him, I said, listen, I gotta be, he says, Maurice, you know, he said, you did a great job. And um, I said, I gotta be honest with you, man. I said, when I sing in your, in your office, he's like, yeah, I said, I said to myself, and I'm telling you that if you didn't hire me, you was never going to forget me. And then he started laughing, right? <laughs> so he said, he said, let me tell you what I told Mark Swinton. He said, who is that guy? How come I've never heard him before? So that, for me, he was like, I'm doing something. Um, in a couple of months, I'm going to call you back. I want you to be a part of it. And that was Aunt Bam's place. You know, so... That's where it all kind of started, you know, kind of started rolling. And again, I mean, if, if I want to say one of the greatest, one of the greatest things that happened for me by working with Tyler Perry was I have some so many great relationships. And a lot of people always like, well, can you connect me with Tyler Perry? I'd be like, no, because I don't have his number. <laughs> they call me. <laughs> it's like, are you available? Available, Tyler wants you to be in this play. If I'm not available, you know, then it's like you go to the next thing. But it was a great experience, great learning experience. Um, the 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 guy's honest truth. I didn't become rich over it. I had a lot of exposure, um, you know, and and I have a lot of great brothers and sisters through working with him. And it's all about those bonds, those lasting impressions, as someone mentioned in the comments as well. Yeah, that's my sister. Um, we're going to kind of talk about Yes. And your, um, someone else in here said, um, hi, nephew. Oh, that's I can't remember yeah, who yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's, that, he's, um, I became his nephew, but his nephew is Tony, Tony Grant. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, he's the uncle of, of Tony Grant, and then because Tony Grant and I, brother, I became nephew too. <laughs> oh yeah. yeah, and that's what it's about. Family support each other one hundred percent, and there's so much love in the comments. Thank you all for just tuning into this great conversation and interview. Yeah. We're gonna kind of get to the funny parts because I know there had to be some things that happened behind the scenes. Which one would have to be your greatest memory? Because I know for me, it would have to be. Um, Medea gets a job, and there's one scene in Medea gets a job oh, where Lord. Patrice, oh, who plays Patty, oh, <laughs> she got on top of your head, and Patrice is like at least because I'm five seven, she would have to be, in my opinion, she she's kind of short. So I'm I'm like, how does she get up there? I turn and I look at the TV screen. She's on top of your head, yeah. and. I thought it was Cheryl Pepsi Riley's character or one of the other characters in the film was like, get off of him. No, she was, was on top of your show. So, yes. That was, that was Tamar. <laughs> that was Tamar, Tamar Davis. Yes. Um, that, again, random. 
that's the creativity. That's the that's the pleasure and the and the 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 wonderful experience of doing live stage. Whatever you can think of in the moment, it could happen. You know what I'm saying? It can happen. You can do it. If if it if it fits, I mean, you you give it a shot. You know what I'm saying? If it, if they didn't like it, they'd be like, "Don't do that no more." You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but it was so funny in rehearsal. It was like, yo, Tyler was like, you got to keep that. You got to keep it. That was hilarious. And so, you know, when she first did it, my expression, even on stage, was the same expression that I had when she first did it. I was like, what in the world? Like, <laughs> she's on my neck. And she's like, woo, woo, woo. You know, and then she started braiding my, my, my toupee and all this crazy. It was like, yo, it's just like crazy. And that's just so, you know, um, what what's amazing about um, you know Patrice Lovely and her creativity and being such a funny um, person, an artist who just creates just right at the top of her head. You know, we all, a lot of us. You know, once you, once for me, once I get to who my character is, I, I line up my backstory. Where is this person coming from? So that the audience will see a real person not somebody that's fake and that you are um, just making up as you go. You have to have a backstory to make that character real, you know, so that you live in that, 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 that character, you know? So um, being Carson, there was another guy who was Carson originally before me. And this is where, things get like real serious. Like when you're at that level and you're working with the Tyler Perry's and these, you know, big producers, if you can't take direction, well, you may not be that long. And this person, they let him go when we went to lunch. So if you're in rehearsal with me and we come back, and you're no longer there. It's like, yo, you firing people at lunch? <laughs> it's, like, yo, it's like, yo, that's a long ride back to the airport. So then it was said, like, yeah, every, you know, just let it be known, like, you know, you're, everybody's still on, on a trial. So what that does, if anybody else want to not take direction, and so all along, I was watching this person. And I was like, I know who I would be if I was that role. And so I had already channeled my grandfather and um, how he, you know, he, even though he was old, old, and he was an old man, he was still smooth. He was, you know, he still had his, 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 his swag. And so if anybody looked at the, uh, at the, uh, you know, they saw the show, they would hear me say, yeah, come on, Jack. You know, you you know, I'm talking all this stuff, and um, I ain't your man, you know. And you're the one who's been putting them blue pills in my water, you know, all that kind of crazy <laughs> stuff. You know what I mean? Um, but he, my grandfather, would talk like, "Hey, man, you know, you know, he he had his he had his slang, he had his words that he was speaking, the wisdom that he would speak, but he was always so cool. And so when Tyler saw me, I was walking. I was another guy. I was somebody's husband in the play. And I was walking past the table because he was trying, we, you know, we're getting ready to start doing dress rehearsals. And we didn't have a Carson. And he looked at me and he said, Maurice. I said, yep. Yeah. He said, you're going to play Carson. And I started laughing. <laughs> and and I, he was like, what? What's so funny? I was like, I knew it. I knew I was going to be Carson. He was like, well, you're Carson. And uh, and then so automatically, you know, one night when I got on stage, I just kind of started feeling, feeling out certain things. And um, when I said some, certain words, they were in the back cracking up. He and Aunt Bam, you know, they were in the back laughing. He was like, you got to keep that. You got to keep that. He said, that was so funny. You know, so you kind of create as, you know, that in in the moment and see if, if things work. You know, you don't want to be doing nothing stupid, but, you know, see if start, certain things work, you know, and it works. So, you know, yeah, it was, um, we, you try to have fun. You don't, 
when you do what you love, you it's it's not like you don't want to work under pressure. You know, you don't want to sing under pressure. You want you want it to be something that that you get a joy out of doing. And if you're working with somebody who's a tyrant, then it's like you gotta mm, learn how to bob and weave until the until the contract is over. <laughs> and get out of there. Make your money and bounce. You know, and, and I don't like having to be like that. But there's certain times where you work with certain people where you just make your money and you bounce. Absolutely, 100%. Thank you all. Thank you all so much for tuning in. If you're just coming in, we're sitting here with Maurice Slotner. Now, Tyler Perry. Yeah. Um, there's got to be some, because I've seen, I've watched, I have a bunch of his DVDs, and I've watched some of the behind-the-scenes things that have happened, you know, when the cast, when the cast, yeah, the cast members are you know, not taping. They're all set. They're behind the scenes and things like uh -huh. that. What was it like seeing him outside of Tyler Perry and into Medea? Because I know there had to be, like, I got to keep a straight face. I can't break character. Has it ever happened? No. Me, no. I was the person that would not break character. You know why? <laughs> because I'm a professional. <laughs> so, but it... it it was funny because people would try to make me break character. Palmer Williams, when we did the having to have nights, he said my sole purpose on stage every single night with you, Maurice, was to make you laugh. He says I couldn't do mm -hmm. it. He says I oh he says I almost did it, but I couldn't do it. And I'm the type of person once I start laughing, I can't stop. So I always have to kind of stay like especially on stage. I don't like to be embarrassed. I don't like you to try to embarrass me. You know, so I, I kind of just stay. I know what I'm supposed to say. I know who I am on stage, you know. Um, but so I'm just like, no, I'm not laughing. And Tyler Perry said it one night. He was like, he says, ain't nobody else going to stick to the script. He's like, he is. <laughs> like, Yo, because I come from that act was actors equity you know what i'm saying legitimate like they call what tyler perry and that tyler perry and some other you know playwriters do the chidlin circuit where and i've experienced you know doing a national tour with the wiz with stephanie mills you know what i'm saying mm. you know with with um the original wiz you know what i'm saying so i've worked on the legitimate actors' equity stage, so where and you you you're not doing all of this ad living. You you you're learning the script. You're learning what you're supposed to say, and you do it. So when you come from that legitimate type of um, atmosphere, going into an atmosphere where it's a little bit more loose, it may not it may not be undergirded or overshadowed by a union. You know what I'm saying? So then you know. Um, I I just felt like no, you know, no, I'm not doing that. I was, I, I I've experienced like being, you know, a step away from Broadway, you know. But I was doing an Actors Equity tour, where we toured, and um, it was it was amazing. You know, there were rules, there were regulations. You, you know, that's the difference when you work in one place. The rules and the regulations are according to what the man or the production is saying. But when you're working with Actors Equity, there's a book. They have this type of lunch. This is when they're supposed to break. This is why much they get scaled for pay. This is um, what you can or cannot do. When you don't have a union, it's like you can do whatever you want. You're not canceling. You're not canceling stuff. And there's no, there's no, um, no, uh, um, recompense for it. You know what I'm saying? I was on a tour where it got canceled. Um, who, you know, a production I will leave nameless, but I was on a tour where they canceled the tour on the day I was supposed to leave. Oh. Who does that? You know what I'm saying? So if it was a unionized tour, you know, then it would have been like, okay, look, this is how long were you going to work? Okay, so you're working from September to November. Okay, what is the the amount of money you were going to earn? 
there was some productions. There was a production that I was with. I worked with one time. I got a call in the morning, seven o'clock in the morning from not even from the production. It was from a friend who brought a ticket. They called me and said, hey, yo, um, my sister just got her refund for her ticket. Y'all, y'all not, y'all not coming to a Fayetteville? And I was like, what? He said, yeah, they, then an hour later, hey, um, tour's been canceled. What? So here we are now out of work for two and a half months. And nobody, nobody says anything. So what do you, and this is the, and, and I say this to people who are listening, who are in the business or who aspire to be in the business. This business could be wonderful and then it could be a mess. You know, because you have certain people who don't care about your welfare they don't care about how you survive in the, in the business. And, and these, you know, these are people who, you know, they, they write their plays and they book you. But if things don't go the way that they are expecting it to go, you know, they were like, well, we can't do it. And then that's it. And then you're out of a job. But then it's like, what happens when you've rearranged your life or you've turned down other things because you were looking to do this. There's no recompense with that. You know what I mean? And then it doesn't make sense because if a person, you know, doesn't say, hey, you know what? I know what you guys were expecting. You know, here's blah, 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 blah. Nothing. And so that in the business, it, it looks good. So It looks good on the outside. But then when you're experiencing being on the inside of it, you know, it's it's not always a wonderful uh, experience for you. Because I, I'll be honest with you, my family, you know, we struggled for those three months. You're talking about, you're talking about being employed and earning enough money that will sustain you into the new year, into the new year. And so we, we struggled. I mean, I've experienced you know, being uh, on platforms that you guys seen me on and was two and three months behind in my rent. Thank God, you know, for the ministry and, and, and church and having a church family. I never forget it, man. And I say this, I say this as a testimony for a lot of y'all, you know, people who uh, are looking on the, on this live, you know, I've experienced people handing us giving us that Holy Ghost handshake because they found out yeah. that, you know, uh, the tour that I was supposed to go on was canceled. No explanation. It was an explanation given to the, to, to the community. But what about the people, what about the artists, the people who are going to work, you know, and we're, we're going to earn, what about the father and, and the husband who was out, you know, preparing to earn for his family. And then there's nothing. You know, it, it takes a lot for you to continue on in this business when you've been hurt. You know, so you got to have thick skin being in this business. It's not something, you know, I've been in the business probably as long as some of you have been alive. You know, I've been in it for at least 30 years. You know what I'm saying? So it's it's a blessing because you can look at those things and then move fast forward and see me right now. But the experiences are not always a wonderful experience. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah, that's the difference when you're in the union. The union covers you from foolishness. And, and you know, people who just be like, well, I don't feel like doing it. They'll, they'll figure it out. And I think that that's just cold. I think it's cold. I think it says a lot about a person's character. You know, I think it says a lot about the people who write these these shows and then they don't have enough money to or they don't feel like whatever, you know, and then you you abruptly unemploy 15 to 20 people. You know, and then you got to figure it out. You know what I'm saying? You know, so, 
yeah, I've I've experienced those things, man. I've experienced shoot, man. <laughs> I told y'all in the beginning when I brought that 1992 car, you know, um, the uh, guy who knew me, he was like, yeah, because me and my family was in the car. And I, my kids are not small. You know, they were in high school. And I was bigger than I am now. And my family, we were on our way to church, and we all bunched up in this little 1992 Toyota Corolla. And I was like, yo, we getting where we got to go, you know. But. You know, I, I did some projects, I did some work, and I brought me a new car. But for someone to be like, ooh, looking at me at the light, and you're like, man, y'all bunched up in there, ain't you? <laughs> like, yeah. But you deal with those type of things, but you keep going because if you if, if, if I didn't know that God had promised me some things, you know, it would have been easy for me to give up and throw in the towel. But I remember what God said. He says, I'll be with you. Always. Okay. So while we're going through all of this stuff, you know, in different transitions in life, you got to know that he's with you. And then that what that does, it helps you to get to to the next page and then the next chapter and then the next chapter, because there's some great things that are about to happen for me. You know, that is another chapter. But we'll talk about that. I don't know how long you got. We almost done. Right. It's like an hour. Right. Yeah, a, a few bit more. Yeah, a few bit more, and then we're going to conclude, ladies and gentlemen. Um, you talk a lot about God yeah. and how he's gotten you through, and I'm a firm believer as well, too. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about how the free ministries came about, because I love watching your lives. It's a lot of inspiration. A lot of people need that during these times. A lot of people are faith-based. We've been through so much, you know, throughout this whole pandemic, throughout this whole entire year from 2020 yeah. to 2021 yeah. to now 2022. And it seems like it's not ending. It's still going on and on. And for people like you who are faith-based, tell us a little bit about how the free ministries came about. Well, before there was free ministry, there was new beginnings. Um, we started a ministry, Alicia and I, we started ministry in uh, Brooklyn. And then the Lord told us to move. And I have a funny story. I'm gonna say this real quick. So when we were moving, my uh, youngest, my daughter, she was coming out of um, middle school. She's coming out of middle school, and then my my middle son Maurice, he was going into the tenth grade. She was going in. Faith was going into the ninth grade, and then my oldest son was just graduating high school. And so Alicia asked my wife asked my oldest son. Do you want to, um, we're moving, the Lord told us, God told us to move down to North Carolina. And, um, you know, you're more than welcome. You're just graduating um, high school. You know, you, you can come and live with us and maybe go to school down there. He was like, mm -mm. he said, God told y'all to move, not me. And so <laughs> we were like, and I started laughing because we taught our kids, you know, to, to speak what you want to, you know, say, you know, how you get say what you want to say, as long as you're not disrespectful. And so um, we packed up and we moved. And um, it, was, it, was, it was crazy because we had started the ministry and we were renting out a space and then the Lord said, do it in your house. And so it was more intimate. And then we had at least like 15 people come into the house every Sunday from the Bronx, from Manhattan, from Queens, from Staten Island. So we, you know, and, just, and he started bringing together families. You know, I used to do security. I used to bounce at clubs and stuff like that at night and do my wedding gigs on the weekends. So it was like I was meeting so many people. And one of my brothers, James Davis, he brought his family to the to the ministry. Um, we met another young lady. and She was loving it. And she, you know, loved what we were saying and what we were teaching and preaching. And she brought her sister. She invited her sister. And then they brought their friends. And so next thing you know, boom, our basement is 15 people strong every week. And then here it is, God says, move. We're like, what? <laughs> and so they, you know, we let them all know that we were moving and they were sad, you know, but, you know, we had given them a good foundation, you know, a good Christian foundation. And they, you know, it, it was it was good for them to continue to grow. And so we moved and then we came down to the church that we were, that we knew where my aunt, uh, where my aunt was, um, a member of and we were there for 10 years and the Lord spoke to us again it's time to start your ministry and 
uh, Free Ministries, again, you know, we, we began Free Ministries. We changed the name from New Beginnings to Free Ministry. Um, and um, we started in, right at, in 2020, we started establishing it. And then we would have our first service, we thought we were, but then the pandemic happened. And so that's when we started, you know, doing lives and whatnot. And uh, Alicia and I, we decided that she would be the primary preacher teacher and she's amazing at it. I mean amazing. You know, because our whole um our whole purpose is, is to preach the gospel, the good news. We've been in church where we didn't hear good news all the time. We've been in church where they were sending people to hell, you know, and and not knowing, you know, how and what they were saying or understanding what they were saying to people when we understood our eyes were open to the gospel. You know what I'm saying? And so mm -hmm. when our eyes were open to the gospel, then we knew that there was something wrong that we were saying because we were, you can't, Jesus, the Bible says, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. Then another scripture in the Bible says, except the Lord build the house, they that labor, labor in vain that build it. Right, so if we're lifting him up, all we do, all we are, are just instruments and vessels that will. And he does the drawing. We speak the good news, the gospel, you know, and he does the drawing. He draws hearts. The good news. Anybody hear good news? You get excited about it. You tell somebody about it. Not everybody. Anybody gonna tell anybody? Oh, I just won the lottery because you got too many people that want with your money, yeah. but <laughs> but. <laughs> Um, you know, you tell people about it, and that's how churches grow. Word of mouth. When people lives are being affected, if you if you look through the scripture, the the Bible says it uses these words, and his fame went out. When people un knew that he was healing, when people knew that miracles were happening, the reputate his reputation, fame went out. And it brought people because somebody went and told somebody, I saw this, I experienced this, I heard this, and it changed my life. You know what I'm saying? So our main, our purpose, our focus is to really speak the gospel, stick to the scripture. If you go any other way, you will. You, it's, it's possible that you will end up in error. But if you stick, stick to the gospel, you'll see people's lives change, you'll see deliverance. You see people being healed. You see people's minds being transformed the way you used to think. You know, uh. you know the things that you used to do and things that you were like, uh, you know, I'm in limbo here. You know, when God speaks to you about certain things, you know, guess what? He's gonna he's he'll transcend your life to where it's so much for the better. You know what I'm saying? And I've been there. You know, we've all been there. You know what I'm saying? We got two minutes. <laughs> Okay. All right. It is time for those last two segments that you guys know and love, Fashion Dolls, and then we're going to wrap up. Um, the first game we're going to do with Maurice before we go is called the Rapid Five, and the second one is going to be called Turn the Tables. And this is where my, the new audience members get to know more about me, Miss Stevie, the hostess. Um, so Maurice gets to ask me questions uncensored and unfiltered in that segment. But this one is called the Rapid Five, and you have to tell me five things that you can't live without. Can't live without the Lord. Can't live without my wife. I can't live without my children. I can't live without my family and my friends. And who else? Oh, what else can I not live out without? Oh, Jesus. Um. Uh. Can't live without music. Mm. All right. So it's the rapid five, ladies and gentlemen. It is time to turn those tables. My heart is beating so fast. Okay. <laughs> Maurice, take it away. You get to ask me questions. I do this with all of my guests. My guests get to ask me questions on the platform so that the new audience members can get to know me as well, too. All right. So take it away. Uh, so you got a rapid five. I'm gonna give you I'm gonna give you the same thing, rapid five. Um uh, uh, what is your what would you say your main purpose is for your platform? My main purpose would have to be to inspire 
black women, to inspire black women, to inspire the next generation, to encourage, you know, and I do it in a way that's so effortless to try to make sure the position is out here for everyone, you know. I'm also a firm believer in God myself. I don't really talk about it a lot, but I definitely am spiritual. And I'm thankful to be here, to be able to spread the knowledge that I have, that God has blessed me with. And that's what the purpose of this platform is for, to educate, to inform, to inspire, and encourage people. Dope, 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 dope. Good. So listen, guys, if you're not following me, I don't know how many followers are on here. I don't know how many people, but I'm here um, at MauriceLochner.com. I mean, at Maurice Lochner on Instagram and Maurice Lochner or Maurice Man Lochner on Facebook. That's my like and follow page on Facebook. Um, everything is Maurice Lochner. I'm not hiding from nobody. I want to be found. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't owe nobody no money, so I'm good. I ain't going to worry about it. <laughs> All right, fashion dolls, thank you all so much for tuning into our exclusive sit down interview with the one and only Mr. Maurice Lockner. It was such a pleasure having you here, and you're welcome to come back to the dollhouse anytime. It's such a pleasure. I appreciate and it. And I'm so thankful. And guys, it's so please welcome. pick up my music and my wife's book. Just type our names in Alicia Lockner and Maurice Lockner, and you can find anything that you want from us. Our music, our ministry, look up free ministries. We'll be live tomorrow at 10 a.m. on Instagram and on Facebook and on YouTube. So yeah, we'll um, we'll be live and get the gospel. Get the gospel. Yes. I know I'll be tuning in tomorrow once you go on. Make sure you guys tune in tomorrow to free ministries. Monday, we have a big surprise for you guys. So make sure you guys tune in. Tomorrow I'll be live on Bego. I have a PK there. And Monday, we have some more amazing guests throughout the week. Thank you all for tuning in to Style by Stevie with the one and only Mr. Maurice Locker. Again, it was such a pleasure having you here. Thank yeah. you for giving us a few minutes of your time. Oh, thank you so much. It's an honor, man. Appreciate it. All right. Take care, everyone. You guys be safe. And the replay will be up. Take care. And we love you all here at Style by Stevie. Thank you all so much for tuning in, ladies and gentlemen. Later.